Okay. The Second Voyage by Elena Nikulina. The Odysseus rested on his oar and saw the ruffled foreheads of the waves, crocodilian and mincing past. He rammed the oar between their jaws and looked down in the simmering sea where scribbles of weed defy uncertain death, and the slim fishes progressed in a fatal formation, and thought if there was a single streak of decent in these waves now, we would be rigid, pocketed, and tended with the battering they've had, and we can name them as Adam named the beasts, slew a new one with dismay, or a notorious one with admiration. They notice us past and rejoicing at our shipwreck, but these have less character than sheep and need more patience. I know what I'll do, he said. I'll park my ship in the crook of a long pier. I'll take you with me, he said to the oar. I'll face the rising ground and walk away from tidal waters or river beds, where herons parcel up miles of stream, over gaps in the hills, through warm, silent valleys. And when I meet a farmer bold enough to look me in the eye, with, Where are you off to with that long, winnowing fan over your shoulder? There I will stand still, and I'll plant you for a gate post or a hitching post, and I'll leave you as a tide mark. I can go back and organize my house then. But the profound, unfenced valleys of the ocean still held him. He had only the oar to ma make them keep their distance. The sea was still frying under the ship's tide. He considered the water lilies, and thought about fountains spraying as wide as willows in empty squares, the sugar strips of water clattering into the kettle, the flat long bisecting the rushes. He remembered the spiders and frogs, housekeeping on the roadside in brown trickles flooring with mud, horse troughs, the black canal, pale swans at dark. His face grew damp with tears that tasted like his own sweat or the insults of the sea. Parthenogenus by Nala Nidahum Once a lady of the Amors, married seven years without a child, swam in the sea in summertime. She swam well, and the day was fine as Ireland ever saw, many a puff of wind in the air, all the day calm, all the sea smooth, a sheet of glass, supple. She struck out with strength for the breaking waves, and frisked elated by the world. She ducked beneath the surface, and there saw what seemed a shadow, like a man's, and every twist and turn she made, the shadow did the same, came close enough to touch. Heart jumped and sound stopped in her mouth. Her pulse ran, raised sides near burst, little currents with her eyes pierced her to the bone, and the noisy abyss numbed all her limbs, then scales grew on her skin. The lure of the quiet, dreaming undersea, desire to escape to sea and shells, the sea tresses where at last her bones changed into coral, and tiny tolls of her arms, pearls of her eyes and deep, long sleep, at rest in a nest of weed, secure as feather beds. But stop, her heroic characters was there, she rose with speedy, threshing feet, and made desperation for the beach, with nimble, stumble strokes she made the sand, near death until the day, some nine, nine months later, she gave birth to a boy. She and her husband, so satisfied, so full of love for this new son, forgot the shadow in the sea, did not see what only the midwife saw. Stalks of sea tangled in the boy's hair, small shellfish and sea ribbons in his two big eyes as blue and limpid as lagoons. A poor scholar passing by, who found lodging for the night, saw the boy's eyes never closed, and in dark or light, and when all the world slept, he asked the boy beside the fire, Who are your people? came the prompt reply, sea people. At the same time, the same tales told in the west, where the woman's own flattery, and to the same in the south, where the ladies call Oshia. This tale's told on every coast. But whoever she was, I want to say, that, that the fear she felt when the sea shadow followed her is the same fear that vexed the young heart of the virgin, and she heard the angel's sweet bell, and her womb was made flesh, by all accounts, the son of the living God.